Okay, thank you very much. We thought we'd do uh, some of these webinars to both promote the ICO and also to provide um, CPD kind of uh, lectures and information. Uh, we hope they're going to be useful. Um, if there's anything particular you want covered, contact us, contact the um, ICO front desk uh, and let us know. What I thought I would start off with with this is you know, a very general uh, introduction. Um, there's so many questions that come up when you first approach sort of classical osteopathy you know, in terms of treatment. The questions I've put up on the screen here, if you can see this, uh, you know, what do I do first? How often do I treat patients? You know, where do I apply certain things? You know, when do I do certain things? And so on and so forth. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of a, um, a guideline, if you like, to some of these things. Um, it's not like it's all written in stone. This is all you know, relative to your patient, relative to the circumstance. Um, and very, you know, depends from, from patient to patient, obviously, but just wanted to provide just something of some sort of guidelines um, as I've experienced them, you know, working and from um, interpreting mechanics um, that was given to us at college and, and through Mr. Wernham from Little John. Uh, I just wanted to just offer something up uh, as a useful uh, approach to some of the classical osteopathic um, rationale, if you like. Obviously, this is really a huge field. This is like, you know, saying, how do you do classical osteopathy? So I wanted to particularly kind of home into a couple of things, um, specifically order in the treatment process and frequency of treatment. Um, frequency of treatment is something that I kind of worked out for myself, but I wasn't necessarily taught, you know, how often to treat um, specifically, generally, etc. Um, but I've been asked quite a few times, you know, in terms of people that have done classical courses, you know, how often should you get patients in and so on. So again, just a little offering, just to see, you know, an interpretation of, of how we might answer that. So in terms of, you know, looking at the order of the treatment, I want to break it down into uh, mechanical perspective. So, you know, what are we kind of trying to address mechanically first in our classical approach uh, and from a physiological perspective? So all those are uh, issues that uh, kind of got thrown up in the advert in terms of vas emotion, visceral emotion, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of frequency of treatment, um, particularly kind of, you know, the acute versus the, the chronic situation. The patient comes in, you know, in dire pain or very, very unstable, uh, as opposed to, you know, the long-term patient that you're slowly unwinding, uh, et cetera. And even that, you know, is quite alien to some kind of osteopathic approaches. You know, I've been in sort of spheres of osteopath talking and, you know, two, three treatments, and then the patient gets sent on the way. Well, classical treatment, we can be treating people indefinitely uh, and hopefully continually improving. We're not talking about, you know, just this sort of resolving symptoms and a maintenance treatment. We're talking about a slow, progressive improve. And also looking at it from a kind of mechanical perspective, as opposed to sort of dealing with ailments, disorders, uh, and so on, as in traditional um, approach to osteopathy. So from a mechanical perspective, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, integrating mobility. One of the things uh, Little John describes in terms of the way that we address the spine is this sense of, of um, integrating mobility. He describes uh, the spinal condition in terms of motility, which he defines as integrated mobility. And so key to classical osteopathic treatment is this sense of, of integration, coordination, uh, and so on. And so we want to have a, get a, a little bit of a sense of that in, in treatment. Um, 
very importantly in our work is the relationship you know through the curves you know one curve to another one curve to the spine as a whole and so on so we want to explore that a little bit very important in our classical osteopathic thinking again is is the, the foundation line then the base uh, triangles of the, the sort of pelvic um, area uh, we talk about the kind of pelvic base the um, foundation and the spine and so on and that's very important our work but again it, you know it kind of it has to be put in perspective uh, and understood in in terms of its its you know importance and then very very briefly um, this is a lecture or two on its own right uh, just sort of saying how that kind of fits in in our thinking with our models of the lines of force the polygons and so on and remember, you know, these are conceptual things um, based on mechanical concepts applied to the human spine. Um, it's not going to be, you know, 100% universal. Uh, we're trying to understand kind of how forces work through the living spine um, and see how our treatment can relate to that. And again, you know, thinking about that in terms of the order of treatment. From a physiological perspective, um, very importantly, we have the whole concept of, of addressing the patient from the sensory side. Um, we talk about, you know, little John saying that all disease begins on the sensory side of the nervous system. And so much of the emphasis of the treatment is in relation to the inside of sensation from the way that you handle the patient through the rhythm, um, through um, the way that we approach the technique, for example, uh, and so on. When we're thinking about um, classical osteopathic approach, we're thinking about treatment of ailments, diseases, and so on. Um, we think about an order in our, our treatment. So somebody comes in with a, an ailment, a, a process going on. Uh, we need to think about understanding what the body is, is doing, uh, understand the physiology behind the condition, uh, and interact with it. And we want to know, um, you know, are we trying to address the circulation in relation to the vasomotor nervous system? Are we trying to address visceral motion? You know, what comes first, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that's part of our exploration. And um, particularly important in you know, a physiological approach is, is the relevance of, of the lymphatic system. And, you know, again, where that comes in terms of our, our treatment process. In terms of frequency of treatment, as I say, you know, acute versus chronic, mechanical versus ailments, we're going to explore those. So in terms of integrating mobility, one of the things that we're addressing with our patient is uh, specific dis you know, disturbances, um, lesions, osteopathic disturbances, um, somatic dysfunction, however you want to call it, um, subluxation. Um, and a lot of this in terms of symptoms is it reliant on understanding the forces that are interacting through the spine. And much of that is in relation to uh, areas that are compressed, areas that are impacted, uh, and areas that are less so. We find between those areas, areas of impaction and, and less impacted, um, the spine kind of acting uh, in a manner of a kind of hinge. So where something is impacted, it's obviously gonna move less, uh, that creates more stress into an area that is um, moving better. Uh, and very often that's what causes the mechanical instability behind the symptoms that your patient comes in with. They come in with pain. Uh, and very often, you know, it's easy to think about, you know, the, the symptoms, the tissues causing symptoms and so on, and uh, look at the mechanics of, you know, where that pain symptom is originating. Uh, and disregard the fact that that symptom has arisen because of you know that area's mechanical instability, that area's vulnerability to stress and strain, uh, and the fact that we need to integrate the mobility. So much of what we're doing is 
addressing imbalances in mobility, trying to change the patterns in the spine, trying to get behind uh, the dysfunctions uh, that are occurring there. And in a broader scale, thinking about you know the mechanics you know, from the postural perspective, from job a uh, person is doing, how they're sitting, standing, lifting, and so on and so forth. It's all very well for us to, you know, enact our treatment on the table, but if your patient isn't advised on posture, for example, you know, they're going to be maintaining, you know, these patterns in the spine to some degree. If you don't tell them, you know, if you don't try to observe how um, problems are occurring in the first place, so, you know, observing at a kind of broad level and quite specifically in terms of the movements in the spine, the physiological movements, how they are distorted, uh, patterns of movement that give you an indication of uh, the kind of injury or the kind of movement that the patient is going through um, that creates this problem. Uh, again, that gives us much more of an idea of how to approach the condition, but also to advise the patient uh, on movement, on you know, how they might be lifting, and so on and so forth. A lot of osteopaths, you know, in our kind of history, have talked about the importance of visualization. Um, Mr. Wernham was always saying about, you know, Hall and how he would picture you know, in his mind's eye, you know, the disturbance that's going on. Still talked about something similar and talked about intent in his work and so on. And that has a lot to do with what we're trying to achieve here. So looking at mechanical disruptions, disturbances, and trying to understand what is going on behind them, you know, what kind of injury occurred. I mean, obviously you take a case history and part of that is, is you know, looking at the injuries, the uh, traumas that the person's body has been through. But even on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, how are they using their body? How are they using their spine? It all becomes part of the treatment process. So in terms of how do we get to this? How do we get into integrating mobility? Much of what we're doing initially is, in a sense, in terms of kind of principles, we're working from the periphery to the center, from the superficial to the deep. Uh, we're working in terms of releasing soft tissue restriction. And that may be through traction, that may be through some more direct soft tissue technique. Much of the time it's in relation in classical work with kind of long leverage. So releasing uh, soft tissue in conjunction with the sort of joint structures, in conjunction with uh, fascial joint uh, ligaments, restriction and so on. Much of what we're trying to do is to decompress. You know, the body is suffering from too much gravity. Fry had said, you know, but it'll be gravity that kills your patient in the end. So we're largely in the work that we're doing, working to decompress, to remove impaction, um, deal with sort of, you know, compressive forces in the spine uh, and take out all those uh, stresses and strains of everyday life and our, our battle with gravity. In terms of restriction, in terms of dealing with restrictions, we're going to, you know, think about articulating quite generally. So partly diagnostically, and then from diagnostic kind of movement into slightly more adjustive movement in terms of the way that the lever and fulcrum work together. And then uh, from that, moving quite specifically, uh, in a, from a general sense to more specific. So we're moving from areas of mobility towards areas of lesser mobility. That's how we kind of spread mobility, if you like, into the system. From there, we then, you know, if necessary, free, free up fibrotic kind of tissues. Now that might be in the way that we use a long lever technique, kind of maybe slowly and deeply, and uh, quite specifically comes to mind where Mr. Wernham, my tutor, um, he would have worked with particularly the left sacroiliac that comes, becomes quite fibrotic uh, alongside the sort of tensor fascia lata and so on, uh, in, in the inguinal ligament and so on on the left side. Uh, he would put uh, the, the left side of the pelvis into a kind of leverage uh, where he was very gently just on the edge of discomfort, of pain with the patient, 
uh, prizing the sacroiliac joint open. I mean, just hold that leverage, gently hold that leverage until the tissues begin to, to change quite deeply around the joint, uh, around the inguinal ligament and so on. Takes a lot of skill, takes a lot of patience. Mr. Wen would often say, you know, he would be sitting there for minutes at a time waiting for things to change. Or it may be we're talking about, you know, in, in terms of fi freeing fibrosis, uh, you know, manipulative techniques like the you know, thoracic mobilization, pelvic adjustment and so on. And then, you know, once we're making you know, changes in the spine, we're releasing certain things, again, movement, you know, whether it be articulation, whether it be traction or a combination uh, to integrate that change and not you know, laboring, laboring, laboring your, your adjustment and, and the work that you're doing. Remember, you know, Still's edict of, of, you know, we find it, fix it and leave it alone. So, you know, we observe what's going on. We make change into tissues. Uh, you know, that includes the integration into the surroundings. And then you leave it alone. You don't keep sort of fiddling and twiddling and re-examining, you know, up to a point you do because you want to make sure that change has happened, but not you know, just keep on and on and on doing the same thing. Part of the whole integration process is making sure that everything is, is adjusted, working right through the body. So one of the things I wanted to sort of bring to, to, to mind is, is the idea of curve relationships. When we're working, we're working progressively with the curves in the spine. So firstly, thinking about the anterior curve relationship. Firstly, in terms of you know, the one anterior curve to the other, so the cervical to the, 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 the lumbar curve. Now, posturally, it's very important. You know, if somebody comes into you with a, a neck problem, one of the things that you're going to advise them at the end of the treatment uh, is to um, be careful how they're sitting, to preserve the lumbar curve, and in so doing, uh, assist the whole kind of spinal orientation to take the strain off the, the cervical curve. And it's the same in terms of the way that we adjust, that there is a distinct relationship between these anterior curves uh, in terms of the way the body moves, in terms of you know, propulsion, head and neck posture, uh, and so on and so forth. This kind of brings us into the way that we look at our um, the PA line mechanics of kind of head and neck posture and its relationship to body movement, to the cavities, uh, and so on. When we're looking at you know the body, when we're looking at the mechanics and so on, it's it's so difficult not to uh, just keep on kind of relating to so many different aspects through mechanics and lines and keystones and pivots and so on. And then we need to think about how those anterior curves relate to the posterior curves that, uh, again, through posture, through injury, uh, you know, one curve is, is affecting another. For example, uh, there's a guy that I'm treating at the moment and in, he's now in his 50s and in his 20s he fell through a roof, uh, quite a large fall, basically smacked round right to his back, it impacted his um, sacrum uh, and lumbar spine to such an extent that um, his sacrum and pelvis are very, very flat, um, and dropping forwards. Uh, and so that we find that then the, the, the upper lumbar and lower thoracic have to compensate uh, and kind of overextend, uh, then disturbs the sort of mechanics into the rest of the thoracic spine. Uh, and then creates a stress into into his um, cervical spine. So again, you know, it's thinking about kind of relationships. And if he'd come into me with with neck pain, then you know, I would have to consider that whole pattern uh, and dealing with the the disturbance of the the impaction of the lumbar, uh, how that relates to um, the the, uh, the the lower thoracic. Uh, and and so on. You know, it's, it's a chain of, of cause and effect. So again, you know, when somebody comes into you with a problem, uh, the emphasis with classical work more and more and more is to, you know, look at the bigger picture. Uh, yes, we need to analyze the sort of detail of, of the issues in the tissues, as it were. Um, but it's very important that we see in context of the forces acting through an area, 
um, how something is in relation to the totality of the body. Um, for example, treating somebody this morning with a, a right knee uh, problem, uh, knee pain, and you know, taking a step back, you could see that the, the, the leg is held in pronation, uh, there's stress going through the knee, um, center of gravity of the particular patient is to the right, so again, more weight bearing through that knee, uh, and so on. And it was very much a picture of you know, trying to adjust the whole um, image of force and center of gravity line uh, and so on to get to the best of that, uh, you know, adjustment to that knee. You know, without those things, that knee is going to struggle to stabilize or you're going to be a very, very prolonged treatment process or you're going to have patients, you know, coming and going and coming and going with the same symptom forever and so on. Very important in our thinking in many ways is the, um, the curves sort of interchange points. So we're talking about um, the cervical dorsal. So how the head carriage is, is so important, the shoulder posture. Um, so often patients come in and they're bracing their shoulders back or their shoulders are up round by their ears because they're very stressed or both. Um, and that in turn affects how the cervical dorsal functions. Uh, and again, a lot of you know, what's going on in the cervical dorsal has to do with head, head and neck posture. And one wonders you know, what you know, sort of the kids of today are going to look like in sort of 20 years' time when you know, the effects of mobile phones and, and you know, game consoles and so on really kind of hits in. Um, it's going to be an interesting period of time for osteopaths, that's for sure. So the cervical dorsal and the dorsal lumbar are very important areas in terms of the interchange of the curves. And when those areas are in, are in trouble, then the curves either side of them uh, struggle. And so we need to understand about how to um, adjust those areas, how to relate to the patterns that are going through those areas in order to um, adjust curves around them. So again, so for example, somebody comes in, um, symptoms in the pelvis, disturbances maybe down through the leg, um, and they're worsened by, you know, as they rotate. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to talk about the mechanics of this in a moment, but part of what we're addressing is that relationship uh, of the sort of pelvic girdle, the legs, through to the spine. And part of our thinking in terms of the way that we look at the mechanics is understanding uh, forces through the spine. Uh, and we have this kind of model from Little John and Henry, the predecessors of, of Little John, uh, in terms of the way force works through the spine. And part of, our, part of the importance of that kind of model um, is down to uh, how the, the, that line of force interacts you know, through the middle of the spine, because that is a junction between movements of the upper trunk and lower trunk, uh, the pelvis and uh, the spine. We see uh, ligaments in that lower thoracic area opposing uh, the movement that's coming from the hips. We see uh, the change in facet angle uh, from the um, thoracic uh, shape uh, and angulation through to the lumbar angulation. Uh, so all of a sudden we've got a change from kind of nice free rotational movement um, in the, the lower thoracic area through to a kind of more of an AP flexion extension movement through the lumbar spine. And that transitional area is vitally important in terms of the way uh, the pelvis moves, the spine as, as a whole moves, the patient you know, walks and moves uh, and so on. And we're looking for a kind of optimum efficiency right through the whole body. So this whole kind of concept of body adjustment is that, you know, it's adjusting the whole body, adjusting the mechanics of the whole body. And the more we can look into understanding what these lines of force represent uh, in terms of applied anatomy, if nothing else, uh, the more our treatment can be effective. And then we come to the whole idea of the, the lateral curve. This is a little quotation from Mr. Wernham. 
Making an adjustment is, a relative, is relatively simple, but to stabilize the condition in order that the patient can sustain normal stress without breakdown is much more difficult. And the short lateral curve is perhaps the most common condition and is the most resistant to adjusted procedures. This was in relation to his discussion on sort of common lesion patterns and um, the way that the body responds in a sort of quite typical common way um, to forces, to lateral curvature and so on. So part of what he was discussing was that not purely in terms of, you know, there being one cause, there's a whole bunch of possibilities that various people, Professor Zink, um, Schamberger and so on, discuss the whole idea of, of this sort of concept, if you like. But Mr. Wenham was saying it seems to be mostly associated with a, a shift of the center of gravity to the right, uh, may or may not be uh, associated with the liver, but we certainly know that when patients are particularly, uh, in the words of the um, naturopaths, if you like, kind of toxic, um, the liver is congested, uh, it picks up weight, it becomes heavier, and because it's not symmetrical, uh, that's drawing center of gravity off to the right. As we say, that's not the one and only cause, there's all sorts of possibilities, but you know we're looking at cause and effect in the body so much. And part of the, 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 the effect of that is if we shift the body center of gravity over to the right, um, then the effect of that is um, more weight going down through the right leg quite often. Uh, tissues on the left side of the body, the left side of the pelvis particularly, because they're beneath the center of gravity, compensating, becoming more fibrotic. So I was talking about just now in terms of the way that we adjust the pelvis using the leverages and the way that Mr. Wernham used to adjust the pelvis. So much of our kind of balancing the mechanics is understanding that and addressing that, even to the extent where we're considering, you know, dietary kind of side of things um, in terms of uh, kind of healthy diet, in terms of the patient's hydration and so on and so forth, that the liver is in a better condition. Um, little John frequently in terms of you know, treating the ailing patient, the patient with diseases, disorders that uh, come to light. Uh, that part of our process in that is that we are working to encourage elimination in the patient. So encouraging bowel function, encouraging um, kidney, bladder, etc., etc. So part of our thinking of you know, relating mechanics to that is understanding kind of how that manifests uh, and how to relate and part of this process part of this is looking at this imbalance and this pattern part of the result of this is that we talk about posterior ilium on the left anterior ilium on the right uh, and a lot of our routine is based around that observing that and relating to that and of course you know we analyze every patient closely it's not a question of uh, presuming that a patient is going to be in a certain way so what Mr. Wernham ended up with was a, this kind of model of, of, you know, the common pattern in the spine, common lateral curves, and this is part of what we're relating to uh, in our patient. It uh, doesn't mean that <clears throat> this is what we're seeing uh, as we examine our patient for the first time, um, but this is very much typically what is underneath uh, the patterns. And this is what we are kind of trying to address and very often where patterns are more complicated than this. There are disturbances on top of this as an underlying or a primary kind of lesion picture. So, you know, what we do find obviously is patients with all manner of different lateral curves and short lateral curves. Um, and so, you know, part of our process is trying to understand how we address that. It's all very well thinking, you know, a disturbance in the middle of the spine that's causing pain. You know, how do I move that particular vertebra or how do I strain, counter strain the structures around it, etc. When it's suffering as a result of the forces meeting at that point. So a lot of what we're doing in terms of particularly the short lateral curve is working to uh, initially decompress. So just take out the sort of compression element of the, these lateral curves. And as you do so, you take out their pressure. 
the intensity of those uh, curves makes a lot of difference to how they are maintained, how they worsen, etc., etc. I've got a feeling I need to put a light on, so just hold on a second. Hope that works. <clears throat> I forgot it was going to get dark. So as we're dealing with these lateral curves, these short lateral curves in the spine, part of our process is to decompress uh, and beyond that to elongate those short lateral curves. One of the things I do a lot in practice is, you know, where there's a very compressed curve is gently decompress and draw those curves out. And a lot of it's done with quite simple procedure, quite simple technique uh, through the oscillation. Here we, Mr. Wernham is uh, performing a, a prone oscillation technique. Um, it can be performed <coughs> to more specific areas or generally through the spine in the sideline. Uh, you can do it sitting, there's all manner of different ways. Uh, but much of what we're doing in terms of the intensity uh, or short lateral curve uh, is working through oscillation. Um, sometimes just coaxing, teasing in one particular direction, sometimes working with a kind of a pull and a push. So uh, we're pulling um, either uh, in traditional kind of osteopathic language, what used to be referred to as the exaggeration technique, uh, either to uh, work <clears throat> uh, with the curve. So where you have a, a you know, lateral curve, we exaggerate it, and it's the name. Uh, here, you know, the picture at the top, we're exaggerating uh, a lateral curve um, through this position, through this movement, through the traction, uh, and below, working against the curve. So this being the original kind of curvature tendency. Yeah, this, as far as I understand from you know, discussion, many different people, uh, this was how li how um, little John and still uh, approach their osteopathic technique uh, in a lot of situations. Yeah, so dealing with the lateral curve element uh, came through sort of you know working with this exaggeration technique model. So we come to thinking about the the pelvic base. Uh, so much of our mechanics centers around kind of relationships, you know, from one area to another, uh, from the, the, the base through to the, the rest of the spine. This image, this model, uh, this is actually a sort of three-dimensional model originally. Mr. Wernham designed, I don't know if he put together, um, but he certainly designed it, um, based on the sort of polygon of forces. Uh, mechanics models that came you know through little john and, and so on um and part of the whole kind of uh, idea of this is looking at the relationship you know from the pelvis right through the body so you know once we find a disturbance uh, in the orientation of the pelvis uh, that begins to and has a knock-on effect right through the rest of the, the mechanics in the spine so we begin to think about the relationship, the correlation between one structure and another, the pelvis and the, the low back, um, the pelvic relations to the third lumbar. Um, so the areas where you see the vertebra there, we've got the third lumbar coming up from the pelvis, uh, 11th and 12th thoracic, the point at which all the lines converge, it's in front of the fourth dorsal, uh, and then the base of the neck, uh, and then the atlas. And again, you know, we see so much in our work about the kind of relationships between these structures. And we need to try and understand you know, what we approach first. Again, this is part of what the whole kind of gist of what we're talking about today. Um, sometimes we need to uh, engage with the pelvis uh, and release the pelvis as a foundation uh, to, to affect the rest of the spine. Uh, and sometimes we need to work, you know, through the lumbar spine to release the pelvis. You need to get a picture of how uh, to examine the patient standing, lying, sitting, um, to get a clearer picture of that. That in itself is a, another huge lecture <laughs> uh, for another day. Safe to say that, you know, we need to try and sort of build a picture to understand you know, how we can get a, a kind of level foundation 
uh, in the spine, how we can use that sort of pelvic spinal relationship uh, to make changes um, you know, between the, the pelvis and, and the spine. Which then brings us into the kind of, you know, the models of the, the lines and the, the, um, the kind of polygons uh, in our work. Um, again, you know, a, a lecture in its own right, um, again, for another day. But much of what we're looking at in terms of, the, of looking at these forces um, is, you know, how we understand kind of the force relationship through the spine, you know, what maintains the integrity of the spine, how applied anatomy relates to um, the shape and form uh, function in the different parts of the spine, um, in our PA line, uh, the line on the right hand side, uh, we're looking at uh, the relationship through head and neck posture, um, through the sort of relationship between the cavities and, and in, in relation to the kind of hip movement uh, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we're trying to understand about kind of getting forces, relationships uh, right through the body to relate to each other again, back to this whole idea of integration. And when it comes down to it so much in practice, these images give us a model to work towards. They give us a sort of an understanding of how to relate to forces, how forces relate to particular areas in the spine, um, and give us some indication of, of kind of how we can work uh, in our treatment. So for example, we might be using oscillation in relation to how those lines correlate to the oscillatory mechanics in the spine. Um, we may be using leverage, uh, long levers, in that same context of trying to relate to uh, the line of force and trying to relate that in turn to the oscillatory mechanics, which again, as I say, is another whole uh, lecture in its own right, or several lectures in their own right. When it boils down to it, much of what we're actually dealing with in terms of looking at these forces is uh, trying to identify with where the, 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 the line of the center of gravity, the central gravity line is in the patient. Uh, that has a lot to, to, do, to do with the way that forces are acting uh, through the tissues, the way the body compensates, how forces are thrown from one structure to another, how, as I said this, um, with this patient this morning, uh, coming with sort of knee symptoms, uh, and it was to do with the whole kind of shift in the center of gravity to the right, the way that the leg was pronating, the way that the pelvis was distorting uh, in, in that picture, uh, and the adjustment of that knee uh, had very little to do with moving the structures of the knee. It had much more to do with adjusting the pattern of the body as a whole. And uh, as I say, that's much of what we're, we're dealing with. As I say, it's not always, you know, just to be... Classical osteopathy very often get this impression that we're just sort of, you know, straightening the pelvis, straightening the pelvis. We have to understand the kind of relationship of the lumbar and the rest of the spine and the pelvis, which is causative to which. And that comes through kind of experience that comes through observing movement patterns, whether restrictions are kind of centered in the spine, whether they're starting uh, in the pelvis uh, and so on. Perhaps it's a lecture in its own right another day. And then, you know, understanding kind of how the, that polygon works, the center of gravity line kind of works, um, not just sort of anteroposteriorly in relation to posture, uh, but also in relation to kind of the, the lateral patterns in the body, uh, the diagonal forces in the body. Mr. So Wenham used to talk about, you know, taking regard of the diagonals. So the tension patterns from, you know, hip to uh, the shoulder, opposite shoulder and how those are important in terms of body movement from the early kind of established movements through uh, the, the baby learning to crawl and establishing the cross pattern of activity and all the consequent reflexes and so on that get established through that right down to the kind of you know how that affects the mechanics of the body uh, and the central gravity line again um, so again you know understanding this is 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 about looking at forces, looking at the bigger picture and trying to understand how these kind of models fit together. 
So from our physiological side, from the physiological emphasis, quotation from Mr. Wernham, the Applied Anatomy book, the science and system of therapeutics uh, of osteopathy con con constitutes uh, the application of physical treatment for the conversion into physiological process within the body. Yeah, but this implies that body is a living, is living, and the vital power uh, has the vital power to convert physical into physiological. So what we are trying to do is to relate at that level. If we're trying to think about, you know, making a treatment process a physiological process, we're thinking about fluid dynamics. We're thinking about the way that the nervous system interacts with the structure and the kind of organic life and the blood vessels and so on and so forth. It is this control which enables us to give osteopathic treatment, osteopathic treatment, a physiological interaction. And much of that, as we say, is, is in relation to the sensory, the sensory side of the nervous system. The word goes on. Uh, an influence, whether inhibitory or stimulatory in character, will tend to travel along the line of least resistance. This is important since an area of the spinal cord has efferent fibers to efferent from many different structures. So in relation to you know, Heads and Hilton's law, we have manifestation of symptoms to the surface uh, and our ability to use the sort of surface and, and structure of the core, if you like, uh, to interact with the organic side. And much of this through the, you know, through the sensory side of the nervous system. So again, little John, uh, so-called primary lesions are functionally, functionally sensory. It's not easy to say, but I haven't been drinking. Almost all diseases originate on the sensory side. Yeah. So much of our treatment, um, little John go, goes on to say from here, is, is essentially aborting disease. How many times have I you know, treated ailments and diseases, dis, I mean dysfunctions in people, uh, and had a kind of distinct feeling that you, know, you were actually aborting process in the body? Mm -hmm. One of the things little John you know talked about in terms of treatment of diseases was you know using the physiology to overbear the pathology so cut away from the underside of the the pathological process using physiological means, so changing the movement of lymphatics, freeing lymphatic function, changing the pattern in circulation through the vasomotor nerves through freeing restriction in circulation through body posture, restriction in fascia, and so on and so forth. In terms of the way we look at the spine, again, in relation to good old heads and Hilton's laws, uh, the sensory areas represent different organs registered in the spine. We mark at the point the contracted muscles, and these will be required, um, we will be relieved by inhibitory pressure, as well as in cases of pain involving the sensory nerves. So much of our work is centered around inhibition. So I just wanted to explore that as a part of this whole kind of sensory model, uh, inhibition and stimulation. So inhibition, where do we apply it? When, how? Initially, where? So we're looking to uh, work with hypertonic, hyperesthesia, hypersympathetic in the paraspinal area. And very often we're working 2D to 2L, so the second thoracic to the second lumbar uh, in relation to that sympathetic chain. Um, very often, if you read through Little John's practice notes, he's talking about treatment of ailments and diseases, particularly in the really acute stage, uh, inhibiting through this field uh, to douse the, you know, the, the problem, to just sort of just soften it. We then, very often when you read through Little John further, you'll find that he uses inhibition to draw to a focus. So he might describe, you know, the process starts with inhibition 2D to 2L, and then we might go from 6 to 12D, and then from 9, 10D. So you, you get this sense of the inhibitory process, the treatment interaction, focusing in at the sort of disturbance, at the sort of key focal disturbance. I've often compared this to um, when we see uh, disturbance occurring in the body that then becomes more significant and widespread. So 
you know, we might strain ourselves at a sort of certain point in the spine. So again, 9, 10, D, lifting something far too heavy in the sort of center of the spine that takes up the compressive load. Um, that strain then uh, over time, over a day or two, then begins to sort of spread in terms of its effect. Maybe the intensity sort of goes down. Uh, and eventually after a week or two, most of the uh, thoracic area into the lumbar area is affected uh, in terms of tension, in terms of the sort of spread of that nervous irritation uh, and maybe sort of the whole of the sort of sympathetic areas involved. So philosophically, we talk about regression of symptoms and regression of, sort of treatment process. And there we see it in practice very often when you inhibit 2D to 2L, uh, if you're doing it sensitively, then you feel the tissues respond under your fingers, uh, under your fingers and thumbs. Uh, and as they do so, you kind of mark out the fields where you want to return to. So in effect, you would be enacting Little John's treatment just by working sensitively. So you start off inhibition 2D to 2L again, uh, and again, maybe that you feel a greater resistance in that sort of 6 to 12D area, uh, and so you come back to that. Maybe not immediately, maybe later in the treatment, and so on, and slowly kind of you know, draw to a focus. When we find congestion in the, in the body, so say somebody has a bronchitis or head congestion, uh, we're very often going to use the, the, the resource of the splanchnic area uh, and offer a little inhibition through there. That obviously doesn't work where we've got congestion you know, through the abdomen, through the um, abdominal viscera, uh, but it does work you know, through sort of pelvic organs, through the chest, through the head, uh, and so on and so forth. And we're drawing, it's as if we create a partial vacuum in this enormous uh, area, this pool of, of uh, circulatory field. So next comes when, when, when do we do this? On a Thursday, usually. Uh, if the patient is stressed, yeah, very often we might do this before anything else. So like this morning, I had somebody come in and... Uh, Long story, she got the keys locked in the car because uh, the dog was in the car and somehow managed to squash the lock thing. Fortunately, the dog then actually managed to unlock it as well somehow. Very strange story. By the way, the patient came in in, a, in an awful stress state because she was late and couldn't, you know, so on and so forth. So sometimes you will begin, you know, normally with our body adjustment, the patient will be lying supine. Um, in this kind of circumstance, we get the patient lying prone. Uh, offer a little inhibition to calm down the sympathetics and, and sort of then free up the patient to be treated. Um, in the acute conditions, uh, for example, uh, I've, I've been in a situation uh, where I've been able to treat uh, convulsions, um, both in epileptics and infantile convulsions, uh, and offering inhibition 2D to 2L followed by strong suboccipital inhibition um, in four cases, uh, four cases out of four, um, um, managed to douse a, a fit, managed to stop a fit, a process occurring. Uh, so again, we get behind the sympathetics and then we get behind you know, local uh, disturbance to sort of hyperactive brain, uh, brain circulation, dysfunction, and so on and so forth. So that's a, an example of, of you know, the acute kind of side of things. Uh, once the patient is prone, so the patient lies down uh, on their front, uh, maybe halfway through the treatment, uh, it's a good time to, to do some inhibition on the, on the patient. Again, if somebody is acutely ill, you know, maybe you have them side lying in a bed, or maybe you have them sitting, uh, just sort of resting over the chair. Uh, the distressed child, maybe you have them on their mother's front, uh, and you'd offer a little inhibition in, in that kind of position. When would you offer inhibition within the processes of you know the the treatment adjustment itself? Um, uh, through the sort of pressures used, which we'll talk about in a moment, or, or in relation to the rhythm. You know, sometimes the, the rhythm itself is um, inhibitory. In fact, most of the time that is so. Uh, and of course, in response to the condition of the tissue. So the tissue itself defines you know, how, how and when you're going to perform 
uh, inhibition or maybe a stimulation. If the tissue is unresponsive, though, it might require that we articulate through that area first. There are other useful tips can be found in Fundamentals of Osteopathic Technique that comes out of the uh, Maidstone of the JWCCO. One of the most useful books I've ever found in osteopathic learning. Uh, not necessarily easy to read or study. It really needs to be kind of studied rather than just looked at. The how, the how and the why and the where. How, pressure immediately lateral to the spinous processes. We see the image there. This is Mr. Worm treating my daughter, who's just turned 21, bless her. So that was a while ago. Um, thumbs are aimed upwards and outwards. You see the picture there towards the transverse process above. Pressure is applied perpendicular to the spine. I'm being very pedantic about the way I describe this. This is the way that I do it. This is the way that I observe Mr. Wernham performing this. Um, it seems to be the most effective way of doing it. Um, and you're also kind of following the tissue and the tissue defines you know, kind of how the movement occurs. So we're releasing in the direction that the thumbs are pointing. Uh, but not necessarily pushing out in that way. You can, um, but the more sensitively that you can work uh, and allowing the tissue to change, the more effective it's going to be. Inhibition is kind of defined by uh, the, the pressure that's applied and withdrawn slowly, waiting for an albeit subtle kind of release in the tissues. Very often, I'm going to talk in a moment about the kind of the balance of stimulation and inhibition, but uh, it's very important that we recognize that you know, very subtle change uh, is what we're looking for in, in the majority of situations. Um, when somebody's in a lot of distress, very, very sympathetic, in a lot of pain, we might want to look for a slightly stronger reaction, but that's another whole thing. And the pressure, of course, is, in, in, is relative to the tonicity or the degree of pain the patient is suffering from. This is a chart, if you've ever seen me lecture, this is one I use to describe inhibition. It's not a scientific model, it's just an illustration. So on our x-axis, is it? We have time, pressure, rhythm, contact, 101 different variables. Uh, on the other side, we have the, you know, the, the actual degree of stimulation or inhibition. So the initial contact with the patient, the soft tissues becomes uh, a very light stimulation, albeit stimulation. If that contact is maintained, the pressure a little bit deeper, etc., that becomes inhibition. I remember that inhibition and stimulation are phenomena of the nervous system. So, you know, in the same sense, we can be talking about the nervous system as well. If that is maintained again, we have a you know a stronger stimulation. Um, it can be used for sort of motivate, you know, very sluggish tissues and sluggish organs, etc. Uh, and again, if that's maintained longer or deeper pressure, etc., that is a strong inhibition. Next kind of point of contact in this kind of scheme of things is, is irritation. Too much pressure, uh, too strong a rhythm, etc., etc., begins to irritate. Um, most of the time, we want to avoid it like the plague. There are times when we want to use irritation. Uh, as part of our treatment process. So if uh, a joint is hypermobile, we want to might offer a little bit of irritation to, to stimulate a tonic response uh, in the structures around the joint. So instead of sort of like the physiotherapeutic approach of you know, doing a bunch of exercise to stimulate uh, a tonic response, we can actually uh, engage uh, parts of the body in that way. Also, we have a, a technique called the osteopathic mustard compress where we're going to irritate the surface of the chest in the same way uh, a mustard compress would uh, to try and balance the circulation between the deeper structures, i.e. the lung uh, and the superficial, i.e. the skin and superficial tissues. So there are times when irritation is, is of value, but most of the time we avoid it like the plague. Uh, and then the end result of all this sort of stimulation inhibition, uh, if we're not careful, is exhaustion. And there are some therapies that kind of work in that field. A lot of sort of soft tissue approaches work to the point of exhaustion and people sort of think, oh, I'm nicely relaxed. No, you're not. You're actually, you know, formally exhausted. Think of how you feel after a sort of real deep kind of tissue work. You don't feel like kind of bouncing 
uh, around very much to him. So more of the how. So we, as I say, we're working from either side of the spinal process in the thoracic area to the transverse process above, which is the same bone. Um, as we get into the lower thoracic, it's more lateral. Um, and as, again, the cervical, uh, it's a more lateral movement. Inhibition itself uh, is defined, if you like, by gentle pressure, uh, applied slowly, withdrawn slowly. It can be hot or cold compresses. How can it be both? Uh, if something is massively inflamed, uh, a cool compress is, is lovely in an inhib inhibitory. Um, if something is hypertonic, a nice warm compress or one of those witty bag things, um, unless you're sort of gluten sensitive, um, it can be very useful. Traction, again, could be stimulation as well, depend if it's sort of applied uh, one sort of traction movement in succession with another. Um, or what we're talking about here is where traction is kind of applied slowly, held, uh, and released slowly. Stimulation, we're talking about more in terms of firm pressure applied uh, more rapidly, withdrawn rapidly, again, hot or cold applications relative to what you find. More commonly, sort of articulation as opposed to traction. Also, as I say, they're both sort of interchangeable. Um, but normally in terms of an integrated treatment, I'm going to apply stimulation in, rela in relation to an articulate articulatory technique. Then we have what Little John defines as rhythmic treatment. That's not where we're using rhythm, it's where we're trying to restore rhythm. So where an organ is kind of um, lost its tone, lost its kind of rhythmic function, um, we alternate our, our treatment between inhibition and stimulation in the same way that you know, hydrotherapeutics uh, would apply um, hot and cold compresses, alternating one with the other. Uh, the direction that we work, uh, down general principle, you know, this is not again universal and it's not written in stone. Uh, generally, working downwards has more of a soothing, calming effect, particularly in relation to inhibition. Um, downwards is also what we're going to sort of direct ourselves towards downward flow. So, uh, encouraging bowel function, encouraging sort of kidney to release to ureter, etc., etc. Upward is generally more tonic, yeah. or slowing down a downward flow. So if a woman's in a lot of pain during pregnancy because the, uh, the, the during childbirth, sorry, um, because of the intensity of the birthing process and because it's, it's accelerating or moving too fast, um, then we would offer inhibition upwards. Yeah. So the inhibition soothing, calming, uh, the direction upwards to try and uh, dampen the uh, sort of downward flow. Same if you're treating somebody with diarrhea, except it'd be more of a distance. Again, we look at you know there's the whole idea of viscera motion, vasa motion in terms of the treatment. When we're working through the sensory side, uh, one of the things that Little John says, you know, the initial kind of interaction is to deal with the sensory side of the nervous system, and as we do that, we sort of dampen the reflex overload and as that happens we begin to free up the sort of normal viscera motor activity so part of interacting initially is soothing calming which begins to restore a, a normal viscera motion try it and see um, we also work with this kind of concept of, of, of more of viscera motor interaction before vasomotor uh, again, that's not universal. There are times when, you know, uh, describing with a sort of epileptic condition might be a, a different kind of process going on. Um, under the basis, what Little John describes, you know, we shouldn't be putting fresh blood into a moribund organ where an organ is sort of sl sluggish or malfunctioning. We don't want to um, be encouraging sort of vasomotor circulation, circulatory forces into that organ without stimulating a, a, the activity of that structure first. Otherwise, you're just putting more pressure on it and likelihood that 
treatment process would not be effective. And then we need to coordinate uh, with peripheral and spinal work. So it's all very well, you know, working, you know, within the, the fields of the, the, the sensory nervous system uh, around the spine. But again, we need to coordinate that with you know, the, the sympathetics in relation to the rib heads, uh, the way the thoracic spine is under pressure. We talked about the curve relations, so come back to that in your mind. Uh, and so, so, for example, if somebody's got a bronchitis, we would talk about uh, a general treatment of inhibition through the splanchnic area, so maybe 6 to 12 uh, thoracic area, um, and then uh, release the interscapular tissues and the way that that affects the vasomotors through the lung field and so on. These are all, you know, kind of concepts that we explore within classical osteopathic work. And then looking at the mechanics of the, that sort of condition. So, you know, why is the thoracic spine in that particular state? Uh, let's, in Little John's sort of language, get way behind it, release the pattern that's sort of maintaining that. And then finish with integration again, coming back to sort of moving all the structures, calming everything down or stimulating everything as per necessary, uh, integrating so that the body settles quicker and, and deals with those exaggerations. Yeah, in terms of the sort of lymphatic side of, of treatment, uh, a more kind of lymphatic emphasis in treatment which is involving kind of lymphatic pump movement, uh, releasing particularly the inguinal area and the base of the neck, the upper thoracic area, so the thoracic ducts and so on. Um, these are very often done at the most acute of ailments, so your childhood ailments or, you know, where symptom picture is not very clear in the child, we might perform a bit of a lymphatic pump. Uh, very often very useful that it, douses the condition, begins to stir the kind of fluids of cleansing and so on. Uh, same in the most chronic conditions. So somebody has chronic arthritis, uh, a chronic eczema, um, we're not going to want to stimulate kind of blood movement before uh, freeing quite deeply uh, lymphatics um, because that imbalances the tissues in the sense that um, we don't want to cause further inflammation. So we want to cleanse, get that cleansing force working again first, uh, and then uh, begin to interact with the circulation. It's just a kind of little pedantic kind of way of looking at things. Uh, it's also my interpretation of the way Mr. Wernham used to perform the body adjustment in that he wouldn't sort of work loosely with the hip joint initially, He'd go straight into interacting with the pelvis. As a patient, you can feel very strongly that it's you know, releasing the tension through the inguinal ligament. And my thinking, whether it relates to the mechanics or not, uh, that certainly kind of stem stimulated sort of a deep circulatory response. Um, also, in terms of the circulation, freeing the sort of restriction in circulation before you start moving it around. Um, Little John's practice notes again. Uh, um, in terms of congestive heart failure, he terms, talks about getting that um, the circumduction of the limbs most effective um, as the first stage of treatment to get the peripheral circulation moving. So here, you know, looking at that kind of leg leverage, thinking of the structures that we're affecting um, through the femoral triangle, through the inguinal ligament, uh, re reducing the, the restriction to the, the circulation again. People that have heard me talk before, you will hear these things come up over and over again because they're truths in our work and that's part of how and what we're doing. So thinking about the lymphatics as a sort of cleansing force in the body uh, and a quite a primary force in terms of its sort of liquid, um, sort of liquid balances, fluid balances in the body. And we must also consider how um, it relates to the nervous system. So uh, in terms of the treatment, uh, we're talking about converting phys uh, physical into physiological um, through the lymphatic pump and so on. The way that you tend to tell whether that's been taken on by the body, so it's been converted from physical to physiological, is there's a more elasticity in the tissues, generally speaking, not universal again. We feel a um, uh, an elasticity in the tissues. Um, 
in terms of the the nervous influence, there are you know uh, vasomotor nerves that affect some of the, the the lymphatic structures, and according to Little John, these are mostly sort of or more significantly centered around uh, cervical dorsal and dorsal lumbar areas. Obviously, I would imagine in relation to the um, cisterna chile lymphatic duct, etc., the, um, the thoracic duct. So I've just Paul, coming towards the sort of end of things, thinking about you know, the frequency of treatment. As I say, this was something I've been asked quite a few times, um, and without meaning to sound patronising to me, it, it, it's kind of common sense that you you got to measure the um, condition of the patient. So let's okay put some words around that. This depends to quite a large extent on uh, the degree of pain. Of course, if somebody's in a lot of pain. You want to help them out of that, um, and particularly where it's really unstable. And if we can um, think about releasing um, palliatively, but also in terms of trying to get behind what's causing that pain. Uh, I do a home visit to um, a 93-year-old who I saw today uh, in huge amount of pain today, uh, the low back, uh, which is very hypermobile, free and sort of stable. Um, she's kept herself fit and healthy over the years doing yoga. Uh, and now we come to the point where her lumbar spine is, is kind of hypermobile uh, and therefore unstable. And she'd strained um, L4 onto a five. Uh, so she's getting pain across the, um, the um, iliac crest on the left. And, you know, a lot of discomfort. So working through kind of the whole process, uh, trying to just gently tease out that, that, that twist in that lower spine, very responsive. Uh, and I booked her in again for four or five days um, to see whether uh, you know, we need to do a sort of close follow-up to that. Now she's not in a huge amount of pain now. I left her in a lot easier state. And I've done what I usually do with her, which is book her in for a month. Uh, and if you know she's completely out of pain by, say Sunday, um, uh, to contact me and cancel. So that's just a kind of example. So the degree of pain, <coughs> or the intensity of symptoms. It might not be pain. It might be a head cold. It might be, you know, menstrual kind of condition. Yeah. So it's, it's it's a lot to do with the intensity of symptoms. Also the stability. So again, with this this old lady, I can't tell you how stable that adjustment was. Uh, I can't tell, which is why I've set her up with two two dates, as it were. Um, so the first one, bearing in mind that I've treated her quite a few times before. Um, bearing in mind that I could feel quite clearly a good adjustment um, and, you know, her, her kind of sense of improvement. Um, I'm hoping that that's stable enough to be, you know, for her to be out of significant discomfort for the next four days at least. Um, so I've kind of measured it on that. If somebody was, if I hadn't seen her before and she was in that much pain and it was that unstable, I might see her again tomorrow uh, to follow up and there might be a shorter treatment and again trying to follow through easing palliating and trying to kind of get a bit of stability in the in the spinal structures so kind of you know just drawing this towards a close um in terms of i say the, the acute versus chronic looking at stability looking at the frequency acute to chronic um the stability is relative to sort of frequency intensity of symptoms you know are they coming back is it very unstable in the patient uh, and so on a lot of that has to do with the mechanics which i'll explain in a moment um so in the most con uh, acute of conditions mechanically sort of structurally we're talking about daily maybe two to three days if you know it's a little bit more sort of stable it's not very often i'll do treatments daily you know someone's in a huge amount of pain <clears throat> and then not going to do a lot of treatment uh, in, in a daily process because you're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to move somebody around the table. And often kind of less is better. Just take the spasm out, take the acuteness out, leave it alone. Find it, fix it, leave it alone. That's the same sort of context. Two or three days, once you get some sense that it's, you know, it's stable enough to last a couple of days, it may take them a couple of days to get over the treatment. You've moved something, 
you know, they need to kind of let it adjust, etc. Um, most commonly with patients, I'm going to see them weekly to start off with. Uh, people that aren't in the most acute of pain or symptoms uh, until we begin to get some sense of change, some sense of stability, uh, and so on. And in that case, then we're talking about the kind of, you know, leveling off the baseline, uh, the kind of relationship of the sacroiliac joints is nice and level and mobile. Um, that's usually when I'm kind of moving on from, from weekly. Fortnightly, not everybody knows the word fortnight. I understand uh, every two weeks. Um, uh, we might then be talking about the kind of relationship through to the lumbar spine. Uh, so that whole kind of lower triangle of our mechanics, so, uh, the pelvic mechanics, uh, has become stable. Um, but we're then going to kind of move on towards maybe a monthly spread of treatment. Yeah, and it demands that kind of stability to sort of just spread that treatment out so the patient you know is going to be kind of steady enough, stable enough um, to deal with that kind of gap between treatments. Again, if you create too much of a space between treatments, it's very easy for the condition to sort of move forwards and backwards, uh, take half a step forwards and half a step back, etc. Uh, so you're wasting everybody's time and money. Then in relation to the, the lower thoracic, um, again, it's part of the kind of mechanical considerations and stability um, that we see a kind of correlation in movement, in position um, between the pelvis and, and that uh, lower thoracic, which again gives us an indication that the treatment process is moving forwards. And then maybe then sort of like monthly, six weeks, etc. Right, so this is just you know very general guidelines. It's just what I've experienced. Uh, this is stuff that I've been asked. Uh, um, take it or leave it. <laughs> um, and also, kind of, this all depends on the length and intensity intensity of the treatment. You know, if you're treating daily, you're not going to be doing a great long treatment process. We don't want to stir up too many reactions. We don't want to overstimulate the patient that's that acute. Um, you know, it may be that you know we don't go through a whole routine with that most acute patient, etc. Uh, most of the time, we're dealing with palliation initially. Uh, we're trying to ease things, but mechanically and physiologically. So it may well be that we're doing this kind of inhibitory work, um, uh, as well as kind of mechanically decompressing, taking out the strain in sort of joint structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when I'm talking about inhibition, it might not just be about the pain, it might be about changing the patterns in the circulation. So we also need to adjust. It's all very well relieving the uh, condition, just taking the pressure off things, but we need to change things. It's part of the nature of sort of the classical osteopathic treatment. It's about making change. It's not um, just making uh, a little bit of relief. It's not just about getting a little bit more compliance in the structures. Uh, we're trying to make changes. We're trying to actually adjust things back to uh, some sense of normality and then stabilize. One of the most difficult issues in so much of our treatment is stabilizing. And that's where so much of, you know, looking at the mechanics really kind of comes into our thinking. In terms of the relations of our frequency of treatment in sort of mechanical as opposed to ailments and disorders, again, this depends on the physiological significance of symptoms, you know, if it's appropriate for us to be treating in the first place and not to be referring the patient or calling an ambulance. Um, for example, I treated my daughter for infantile convulsions once. That's one of the cases I was referring to. After calling the ambulance, we didn't know what was going on. She'd gone into a fit, you know, it would be ill-advised for us not to, you know, seek a more appropriate form of, you know, uh, attention, diagnosis and so on. Having said that, I then treated her and the, the fits stopped. So, Also the frequency, intensity of symptoms again, you know, like in the mechanical kind of basis, you know, how stable is that physiology? How, not necessarily life-threatening, but how threatening are those symptoms to the patient's condition? And again, you know, whether that's appropriate to be treating or not, obviously. Uh, and also how the condition improves as you work. Same mechanically, same in terms of understanding the patient's condition. Yeah, do, you know, does the condition improve as you're working? 
And then, of course, the mechanics that relate to that condition. So is that condition like stable mechanically? Is it very asymmetrical? Is it very stressed mechanically? Um, again, which is part of the osteopathic way of looking at condition. Oh, we come to the end. So that's the end of the spiel. Uh, there's a lot more that we can, um, we can talk about in many of these different areas. Uh, I was given an hour and a half, as it were, uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Let's uh, see if we can open things up for questions. Is that a feasibility? Do we have anybody running the show? Have yes, uh, Chris, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. No, I was here. I was, uh... I was worried I'd been talking to my computer for the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no way. No, it was really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, did that so many important topics that, uh, as you were saying, uh, most of them could be for another lecture. Absolutely. So, no, I mean, you know, up to people that, you know, that listening, if people want, you know, particular areas followed up or, you know, different things dealt with um, or specific people that they've heard of within the Institute. You know, we can think about doing that. Yes, definitely, yeah. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions uh, before everybody logs off, um, please send us uh, through the post. I'm reading the post. So, yeah, they say very good, Chris. They're all very happy. Great mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, thank you. It's amazing that we, we can get to all these international osteopaths. They ask, uh, can you read that, Chris? No. no. If okay. a patient has apparently structurally reduced lumbar lordosis, how would you proceed with a reduced lumbar lordosis? Um, look at the posture as a whole. Uh, look to see if there was any history of kind of impactive injury, like the one I was saying with my patient. See again how the, the, the lumbar curve relates to the, the, um, to the sacrum and the pelvis. It may well be that um, it comes from trauma. It may be postural. Somebody sat down badly for you know, day in, day out, watching the TV, working at computers with their lumbar collapsed. Uh, that leads to sort of weakening in the, the sort of lumbar spine, the postural muscles. So again, you know, getting the patient to attend to you know, maintaining a lumbar curve, not in a sense of being really stiff, but just maintaining the kind of erect curve. Uh, but also, as I say, you know, checking out relationships with the sort of sacroiliac joint, the restriction, the lumbar sacral joint. Um, again, it's about integration of the, the different structures. It's not about just what that lumbar curve is doing it's how all the different structures relate and posture and usage it's you know you take it home at the end of the day yeah yeah um they're saying like uh, yeah we, we had this uh, so many times but it's, it's wonderful to hear that again and again and i, I agree it's just amazing how listening this over and over again I focus your treatment on a daily basis in your clinic sometimes that's the the you know the, the fail that we have sometimes with body adjustment you, you tend to sometimes forget about details and, and how much we can reach through body adjustment yeah, absolutely mm. Yeah, as I say, if people want to, you know, sort of follow through on any particular sphere area, then you know, just just let us know, send messages in, and we can sort of address that. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions for Chris before we switch off the the webinar? As I was saying, uh, I would like to to thank uh, to Pindi for us the all. That is uh, thanks to her that we are. Uh, using this um, technology. Also, I would like to remind you, all of you, that uh, next webinar hopefully will be in um, end of October, first of November. And I remind you that we have a fundamental weekends in, in Dorking. Next one will be in October 20 and 21st, and they will talk about the physiological basis of classical osteopathy. Very interesting. Um, also, we will have uh, in December, the first and second of December, uh, um, weekend seminar 
with uh, Sarah Wheeler and Miriam Elkan about obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, it, very interesting one. Uh, we hope it's uh, more than an introduction weekend with two super uh, osteopaths uh, that we have in the Institute. Also remind you that we have a, a working agreement with uh, Cole Clapton uh, and we will have a doc, a Professor Wilfried Janik uh, for two weekends uh, in November and in February talking about the autonomic in health and disease and we have a, a discount for ICO members. And finally, to remind all of you that we have the ICO conference uh, next year, 6, 7, and 8th of April, which I uh, hope we have um, really interesting speakers that I will, I will let you know. And, um, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody is so thankful. Yeah, it's, it's great. So if you don't have any more questions, uh, I, I will just uh, say goodbye to Chris. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, and thank you, for everybody, for joining uh, the webinar. We have recorded the webinar, so uh, we hopefully uh, we will put in in YouTube but later on, maybe in a couple of months or three. Uh, just now, I put uh, Tim Sparrow's webinar that we had in June or July. Uh, so just to let you know, okay. Um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Okay. Gracias. Gracias, amigos. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.